Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your presence here with us right now, Lord. We thank you for your word, God, that your word is living and active, that it's sharper than a two-edged sword, Lord. It judges our thoughts and, and, and intentions and divides the heart and all that stuff, Lord. Uh, God, it, it, it brings about change, God. It's a means by which you uh, transform our hearts and change us. It's a means by which you help us see who you are. It's a means by which you help us see who we are, God. Uh, so, Father, we just uh, pray right now, God, that you'd open our ears to hear what you want to say, open our eyes to see what it is that you want us to see this morning out of your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Awesome. Hey, if you've got a collection of ancient documents there that we, we fashionably call the Bible, oh, that's right, wrong button. Uh, turn with me real quick to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, real quick, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 11 to 13. Speaking of Jesus, and, and John, John kind of, at the beginning of, of his, his um, story of Jesus, he kind of summarizes, here's what's going on, and here's what's happened, and so on. And speaking of Jesus, he says, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. In other words, Jesus came. God came to the creation that he created, but whilst he was here, present with us, his creation did not want to receive him. They, they rejected him. He said he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of the will of God. That word there where it says that he, he, whoever received him, they were given the right to become children of God. It means the authority, the power to become children of God. In other words, I, 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 love, I love how uh, the gospel writers, uh, they, they, they speak to us of God not as, you know, when, when I came to Jesus, I didn't come to a taskmaster. I, I, you go back to Matthew 6, and uh, when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, and we've, been, we've talked a bit about this, but he says, here's how you pray, our Father. He just wants us to know straight away that you're approaching a father. So when you think of God and when you come and pray, I want you to think of God as a father. I don't want you to think of him as a judge who's waiting there with a hammer, thinking of all these reasons why he won't listen to you when you pray or why you shouldn't be allowed in his presence. He's not sitting there ready to wave you away. He's not like Santa Claus, who's, who's a very performance-oriented kind of a figure, isn't he? And, uh, you know, he sees you when you're sleeping. He, he knows when you're awake. Weird stuff that. I don't know why we sing that to kids. It's going to freak him out. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Why? You've got to be good because if you're not good, you're going to go on the naughty list. And if you're on Santa's naughty list, what do you get from Santa? Nothing. Nada. Nietzsche. And nothing. You're wiped. Well, God's not like that. Truth is, we were all on God's naughty list at one point. Jesus came, died upon the cross so that we could all be taken off the naughty list and put on the nice list. Amen. Not nice because you're good or great or never blow it or always do the right thing. Nice because God has clothed you with Jesus and gone, look, he paid the price for your sins. Here's the thing. When Jesus paid the price for sin, now God's not going to make you pay the price for your sin if you put your faith in him because he's not going to punish you both for your sin. That would be very unfair and unjust. Your sin has been dealt with and paid for. And when we put our faith in Jesus, that's what happens. When God looks at us now, he doesn't see me and all my imperfections and tarnished stains and stuff. He looks at me and he sees his son, Jesus. And because he sees Jesus, he thinks I'm pretty cool. Hate to break it to you all, but I reckon I'm pretty cool. And I'm only saying that not because I feel it, not because my brain tells me I am, but because this collection of ancient documents God chose to reveal to me, that's how he feels about me. Amen. And here's the better news. It's not just about me. That's how God feels about you as well. Amen? God thinks you're pretty cool. He thinks you're okay. Not because he doesn't know all the other junk, but because he chooses to go, I'm going to just imagine and take as if Jesus dealt with all that other junk, so I'm not focused on the other junk now. I'm looking down from heaven, and as John says here, if you would receive him, he says, I give you the right, the power, the authority to be a child of God now. You're a child of God. God is your father, and you are his son. God is your father and you are his daughter right now in this very moment. Now, that's a, that's a reality. That's not a concept. That's not a theory. This, according to God, is reality. Anyone ever remember a series of movies some years back called The Born Identity? Anyone remember those movies? Yeah? How good were they? 
They were awesome. My wife loves the Bourne identity because she loves any movie where somebody can do this and hurt people. <laughs> it doesn't matter who it is. Her, if there's someone that can just unleash on the screen the fury and the rage that at times might be pent up inside of her and get away with it and people cheer and clap, she loves those types of characters. So she loves Jason Bourne. He's sitting there, mild mannered on a park bench one minute with police officers about to arrest him and all of a sudden, I got ma! And they're flying and falling and he's just doing all this, bang, and then next thing you know, they're on the ground, he grabs a gun, disconnects it, and then just walks off, cools the cucumber like nothing happened. How cool is that? Huh? Well, that movie's actually about a guy, and I don't know if you remember the movie, they, they, they find him floating in the water at the beginning of the film and put him on a boat and so on. And the movie, the series is about a guy who's lost his identity, but he's trying to rediscover who he is as the movie goes on, right? And, and, and you know what? When we get saved, here's the thing. Part of what God wants us, some of us think when we become Christians, the starting point is now, what do I have to do? Okay, what are the do's? I've got to find the do's, start doing the do's, and stop doing the do's. We think that the, 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 the unfolding of our Christianity is, is about what we do. But God says, no, the unfolding of your Christianity is not about what you do, it's about who you are. Now, what I want to do, you come to faith, I want to take you on a journey now, and I want you to rediscover your genuine, true identity, not the identity you think you have, not who you think you are, but I want to unpack for you through the pages of these documents, through my Holy Spirit and my encounters with you, I want to unpack for you who you actually really are. Who you really are. This collection of ancient documents tell me who I am now. Now, my brain goes tilt, tilt, I don't get it. Because I know some stuff about me. I know some stuff about me that you don't know. I know that much information about me that I formulate in my head who I am. And then based on that understanding, I then put my feet on the ground in the morning and I tend to walk in who I think I am. Whether who I think I am is really who I am or not. And God wants to go, Alan, I want to unpack for you who you really are. So when your feet hit the ground of a morning and you start walking, you actually start walking in who you really are, not who you think you are. My emotions go tilt, tilt when I think about what God says about me. Because emotionally, I go, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't don't get it. It doesn't feel right. It feels awkward to think that's me. I feel like... But God goes, you know, I want to unpack some of that stuff. And I know you might not feel it. But I want to help you rediscover what your genuine, true identity is because I want you to walk in who I say you are now because right now you're a son of mine. I'm your father, you're a son. And I want you to learn to walk in your genuine, true identity instead of the identity you think you have that you've given to yourself or maybe your parents gave you or culture gave you or the community gave you or maybe even your church gave you. He says, I want you to begin to walk in your genuine, true identity. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, right? It doesn't say, therefore, if if you're pretty theologically intelligent and you're in Christ, you're a new creation. But if you're theologically a bit back there, you haven't learned enough scriptures, enough memory verses, well, then just pick that up first, then we can chuck. It doesn't say that. If anybody, therefore, if any affluent person is in Christ, Therefore, if any male is in Christ. Therefore, if any person in this denomination would be... Anyone is a pretty broad word, isn't it? Hands up if you think that when you read that and Paul says, if anyone is in Christ. Hands up if you think you fit into the category of anyone there. Okay, so, so you think that this is speaking to you. Then the challenge is not knowing what God says about us. The challenge is believing it. The challenge is believing it and believing it enough that it translates into action in our life. Amen. God's not interested in saying, come to me and I'm going to get you to do, do, do. The starting point is come to me. I want you to start to believe what I say about you. Because if you start believing what I say about you, then doing the doing will become so much more natural and easy. It won't be an effort. You won't constantly feel like you're burning out trying to be something. It says, I want you to believe who you are first, then you'll live it. Then you'll start to walk in, and then you'll start to live it. Uh, in, in Judges chapter 6, go, go with me to Judges chapter 6. We've got the story of a, of a guy called Gideon. Anyone ever heard of a guy called Gideon? Yep, Gideon, Gideon's a, a, a pretty cool dude, and the story of Gideon is pretty amazing. But Gideon, uh, in Judges chapter 6 and verse 11, we pick up a bit of the story of Gideon, and here's what it says. 
in, starting in verse 11. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite. We get all these descriptions in the Old Testament that belong to them as if we're meant to know that was a neighbour and the guy, all these names. It says, While his son Gideon threshed wheat in a wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So here's, here's, Midian, here's Gideon in a wine press, right? Now, I want you to imagine and, and try to go beyond just the linear black and white words on a page. I like to read this stuff and try to think about what, what was going through their mind. How did they feel at the time, all this stuff? Now, Gideon, it says that he's threshing wheat. Now, what you do when you thresh wheat is you're out there in the open, you put the pitchfork in, you throw it in the air, the wind comes, blows away the chaff and all the other stuff, the good wheat falls to the ground, that's what you do. But it says here that Gideon's in a wine press, which, anyone know what a wine press is? It's a hole in the ground, basically. He, he's down in there threshing wheat, and why is he doing it? Well, it tells us, because he's freaking out about the Midianites that are going to come on in and raid, and they had a habit of coming in and taking the crops and so on. And so here's Gideon in that moment, in a wine press, threshing wheat, in a wine press, in a hole in the ground, scared and fearful. But an angel of the Lord appears to him. And the angel appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valour. And then we all know the rest of the story. Gideon goes on and goes, hang on a second. You're, you're standing here saying to me, I'm a mighty man of valour. That's what God's saying to him. God's looking at him going, I see in you a mighty man of valour. In other words, your identity is, in my eyes, you are a mighty man of valour. And Gideon then goes on and goes, hang on a second. I am the least of the least of the least. My family's the least. My clan's the least. We're the least. And I'm the least. And the whole bunch, I'm the least of the least of the least. But God's looking at him going, but I'm looking at you and I'm saying to you, you're a mighty man of valour. In other words, I've got a picture of who you are, but Gideon's going, yeah, but I don't agree with that picture. Here's my picture of who I think I am. And through a series of events, I think God has to get him to believe that he actually is a mighty man of valour, that he is a warrior. God's got to get him to see himself the way God sees him so that he can then stand up and a couple of chapters later go on and do these amazing things for God. But when, by the time he steps into it, He's starting to believe some of the things that God has to say about him. And some of us are running around trying to do, 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 do. But have we ever stopped and thought, do we actually believe that we are who God says we are in the first place? Otherwise, the person trying to do is a different type of a person. It's not the person that God originally said, hey, you're the person that could do this. See, God's not wanting us to run around do, do, do. The starting point is B, B, B. The just shall live by faith. We live by faith. And part of that journey of faith is going, I don't feel it, I don't think it, but God, if you say it about me, I'm going to start to believe what you say about me. I'm going to take to heart, Lord. Why would my father tell me lies? Why would my father lie? My father wants me to see who I am through his lens and through his eyes and not just the way that I see myself or society sees myself. Luke chapter 4, uh, we all know the story. Jesus, after the temptation, he goes into the synagogue and it says he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he, it says that when he was looking at that, it says that he went, he opened it up, unrolled it and he found the place where it was written. And the place where it was written was the place that spoke about who he was and what he was going to do. And then he begins to read out, you know, the spirit of the Lord's upon me and, and so on. And I read that scripture often and, I, and, and I'm reminded myself, do I take time to unroll the scroll, open the documents and do I go and look in there and find my sense of identity and who I am? Do I find it in here or am I finding it in everything else in life? Where do you place your identity? Which identity is most important to you? Which identity has the more control over the person you become, the things that you do? Is it what God says about you or everybody else says about you? Or is it what you think about you? Because I think what we need to do is get to the point where we actually start, start believing what God says about us and we put our feet on the ground in the morning and we go, God, that's who I am. I know I think this, I feel this, but that's who I am. I'm going to start believing that and put my feet on the ground and every day I'm going to start walking in believing that this is who I actually am, Lord. Because this is the person you see me as and it's the person that you see me as is the person you want to use to do and so on. But do we really, really believe it? I look around at the church world today and you know what, I'm, I'm more and more convinced. I'm more and more convinced that the world is not looking for a gathering that has a better light show than... The, the world's not looking for a, a bunch of Christians that have laser lights and smoke machines. They're not, not looking for a, a community of believers to attach themselves to who have brilliant musicians and great vocalists and unbelievable skills. I don't think they're looking for a community of faith to attach themselves to who have a preacher who waxes eloquent and is amazing at ripping apart. I don't think that. 
You know what I think they're looking for? I think they're looking for a community of believers who when they get amongst that community of faith, they look at them and go, these guys actually believe the stuff. These guys actually believe. They've got the audacity to think that God is their father and they live as if they actually are children of God. They live as if they're children of God. Do you live as if you're a children of God? You will not live as a child of God if you don't believe what God says about you. And that's the reality and that's the challenge at the moment. It's, it's what do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about yourself? Do, do you even get in? Do we even get into these ancient documents to have a look at some of the things God says about us so that we know what we should be believing about ourselves? Because oh, we, 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 we're so conscious of the image we have of ourselves based on all the other voices we've heard growing up, we need to change the image of ourselves by listening to a better voice. What does God say about us? Who does God say that we are? He, let, let me just throw a couple of verses at you, just really quickly, a couple of verses for you to have a think about. Right? 1 Peter 2.9 says this. It says, but you are a chosen generation. Notice the word you are. Sounds to me like he's going, okay, I'm, I'm about to give you a fact about who you are, right? This, this is who you are. Now, you might not believe it, but the fact that you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true. There are a lot of things in life that are true that I don't believe. There are a lot of things in life I believe that aren't true. Am I the only one here? You guys are too good. I've got to find another church because you guys are too perfect for me. He says, but you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. There's some pretty awesome things there about you. You're, a, you're, you're God's special people. Think about that. Oh, but if only you knew. Hey, you think you know a lot about you. Let me tell you something. God knows way more about you than you know. God knows your motivations better than you know them. He knows your heart better than you know them. He knows your disappointments, your hurts better than you know them. There's nothing about you that you know more about you than God does. Yet God still says, even with all that information, I still think you're pretty cool. Even with all that information, all them shortcomings, all them failures, all them disappointments, I'm still looking. I'm not defining you by your sin. I'm not defining you by your shortcomings or your struggles. He says, I've got a picture of you and here's how I think you are. I think that you are a chosen generation. You were chosen. Anyone watch that movie, The Chosen on TV? I haven't seen it, but I've heard that it's pretty good, but I haven't seen it. But the idea of being chosen, anyone ever go to a sports team and try out or something and feel the disappointment of not being good enough? Anyone ever do that? Not me, I was an athlete. But um, you know, I'm sure there are other people here and you tried out for the sports team, you didn't make it. I know what it felt like not to be chosen for university. I'll put my hand up for that one. I did apply for university, but apparently with my marks, it wasn't going to happen. So I was not chosen. All my friends were chosen. We were in Sydney, got the newspaper back in those days, and you went through and you found your name. Remember that? You'd remember those days, yeah? And my mates went, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. They passed the paper around to me, and I was like, I think there's been a typo. I'm... Maybe I'm in another paper. I'm going to go and buy another one. Maybe they left a page out, you know? But no, no, I wasn't chosen. Disappointment. But I was chosen by God. I was chosen by God. So it doesn't matter. All the other chosens are great. But, but, but you know, there's nothing like knowing that the creator of the universe, the one that said, let there be, that that one there looked down and said, you are chosen. I choose you. God gets no benefit out of choosing me. God is not deficient in some kind of character trait or part of his personality. And by attaching himself to me, he gets something out of it. God gets nothing out of attaching himself to me. But still he says, I choose you. I choose you. That doesn't bring a smile to your face. Think about it. God, the creator of the universe, chose you. You might walk out of here today and you might find an email ripping you apart or someone's going to ring you up and rip you apart or your kids might blow up at you or your spouse might blow up at you or you might even blow up at yourself or the dog might yell at you. But God chose you. It's not bad. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. Be good enough just to be a priesthood. I'm a royal one. I'm a holy nation. I'm his special people. Ephesians 2.10, Paul says, for we are his workmanship. We're his workmanship. Think about it. I don't care what you think. We're so conscious these days of who, you know, my hair's wrong, my ears are too big, my nose is too flared, my, you know, all this. But, but, but I'm the workmanship of God. God made me. God created me. I've got a few little things that I'd change if I was him. Maybe he slipped up a little bit. That's what I think. But he says, no, I didn't slip up at all. I made you unique and beautiful and I love you as you are. I love you. You're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God's actually got good works for you. 
You're probably sitting there going, oh, I can understand you've got good works for Jackie. She's a good, holy woman of God, even dresses in white. <laughs> Symbol of purity. I can understand that God might want to use Daniel or Ruth. I can understand God might use Pete Felsch. I can understand that, but, but, but good works for them to do, but you know, me. He says, no, no, no. Each one of you, God's handiwork, God's craftsmanship, you are uniquely made. You are custom built. You are custom designed with a purpose in mind and God looks at you and he has purpose for you. That's not bad. That's not bad. I don't eat way, I'm not trying to eat my way through life and crawl, get to the end with my last gas breath. <gasps> made it. No, 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 I've got some good works down here that God made me for, anointed me, appointed me to do, and I can't wait to dive into those things and do those things. I'm made for that. 2 Peter 1, 3, it says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Think about that. This, there's this divine power that God has given to you that pertains to life and godliness. You have this divine power in you that God chooses to bestow upon you, whether you feel worthy or not. God didn't. It's amazing that God doesn't ask us that. I've never once said, God, come down to me and say, do you feel worthy enough for me to... He just does it because he's a father and he loves me and he's full of grace and mercy. It, it, it talks about in Hebrews, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses. We have, we have a God that sympathises with our weaknesses. He doesn't turn his face away from us because of our weaknesses. He doesn't get angry at us because of our weaknesses. It says he sympathises, he gets it. Your God gets it. You might want to beat yourself up because you're human, because you struggle with this, you struggle with that, and you're on a journey like we all are, and none of us are going to get to the end of our days and be perfect. We will all get to the end of our days and say, God, I wish I had a bit more time to deal with this or a bit more time to work on that, Lord. I could have been so much better if you gave me another five years, whatever. God's going, it's not about that because I'm not looking at you going better, better, best, best. I'm looking at you going, I see Jesus. The day that you gave your life to me, I put my son over you and I've just been loving on you ever since and I can't wait to have you home with me. It's not about our performance. It's not about how good we are. It's not about looking at what God says and going, here's what most people do, right? We look at what God says about us and then we stop and we go, do I feel like that? Hmm. Hmm. No, not really. Or we intellectualise it in our head. Well, here's what God says. Let me work it all out up here. It's funny, Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says, I pray that you would know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. You ever read that? He's, uh, he's praying, I pray that you would know something that you can't actually know. That's what he's saying. I pray you would know the love of God that surpasses human knowledge. What he's praying is, I, 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 I'm praying that you would experience it. And the way we begin to experience the goodness of God is we've got to start believing it. Amen? We've got to start believing that God is who he says he is. But our brain gets in the way and our feelings get in the way. But God wants us to believe. We, we, want, we want to start believing we are who he says we are, but our brain gets in the way. We, we, we do the internal intellectual gymnastics and go, well, if I really was that person, I wouldn't struggle with this. If I really was that person, I wouldn't do. And God's going, get out of this and, 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 and stop living by all that stuff. The starting point for us is, God, you're talking to me here. What are you saying about me? I'm going to start to try to walk in it and try to believe it. And it's awkward and it's gangly and it's yucky and it feels weird. And the reason we don't is because it feels fake. God says this about us, we get up and start walking like that and straight away we have this wrestle inside where we're then saying to ourselves, that's not really you. And in the end we give up and we listen to the voice again and we stop listening to God and we go back to who we were and what we used to think and, so, and we wonder why our Christian life is kind of like a hamster on a treadmill. We just keep going, we think we're, oh we're back here, we think, oh we're back here. God, I can come to a meeting, I can go to a conference and get all emotionally pumped up and believe you for a couple of days, but then I go home and I kick my toe and that word comes out of my mouth and I think, oh, you're not really, you're right back here. And we hold ourselves back. And God just wants us to believe. God wants us to believe it. It's not about getting up from this place today, walking out and going, well, I'm going to do, do, do. What I want you to think about is when you get up this morning and we walk out, don't think about do, do, do. Think about believe, believe, believe. What am I going to believe? Because if I believe it, if I believe it, it eventually ekes its way into my existence and I become it. I become it. The challenge is to walk in who we are, but it does feel very, very awkward. I was with a bunch of, um, I learned a new word this, this week. Anyone cool? Put your hand up first if you think you're cool. 
I knew you would, Rod, because I think you're cool too. Um, okay, so I learned a new word this week. Anyone ever heard Riz? You know what it is, don't you? Do you know what Riz is? Yeah. Do you know what Riz is? Yeah, yeah, because you're cool. Because you're young and you're hip and you're fab and you're cool. I was with a YWAM school in Brisbane this week and they're all international students from the ages of 18 to 25. There's about 30 of them in the room. And they were, they were teaching me this word over lunch, Riz. Right? Riz is like a charisma. Like if somebody's got, like, they're cool, whatever, you say, oh, you got Riz. So I said to them, that's cool. When I get back to my, my home, I'm just going to say to my wife, she's going to say, how, how are you? I'm going to go, I've got Riz, babe, I've got Riz. <laughs> and she won't get it because she's not cool like me. But I just want to let you know I've got some Riz, babe. I picked up some Riz while I was away, right? I've got the Riz. It's cool, it's trendy. But you know what's funny? Whenever you try something new and you walk around saying, I've got Riz, I've got Riz, geez, it feels weird. <laughs> I feel fake. I feel like I'm not really cool. I'm just trying to say cool words, but I'm not really cool. Reminds me of when my wife, when we first got married and she bought me really nice clothing, right? Remember that? And she would buy me nice clothes and, or a button shirt or something. Recently, you bought me a hat, uh, they bought me a hat uh, and I've got a certain shaped head. Who has a certain shaped head? <laughs> yep, and some hats make you look like, okay, I'm kind of cool. Other hats you put on and you go, I look like an absolute, remember that movie Coneheads years ago? <laughs> Most hats I feel like a conehead, right? But, but every now and then, you know, Jackie, I've got this hat and clothes, and I put them on, and let me be brutally honest with you. This woman who loves me gave me something and wants me to put it on. I put it on and I start walking around. Let me tell you this. I feel like an absolute idiot. <laughs> See these trendy jeans with rips? Once upon a time, I would never have worn trendy rips in jeans. But I married a trendy woman, and she's introduced me to trendy things. But I remember the first time I put a pair of these on, and I opened up my door and went downtown, I thought everybody in the whole street and the whole shopping centre was looking going, what an idiot, look at his jeans. Nobody cared. <laughs> what was stopping me from walking in that had nothing to do with everybody else. It was how I felt about me. It was me. You know, I put the hat on. I walk out and I'm conscious everyone's looking at the hat. No one cares about my hat. It's only me. I feel like an idiot. I feel awkward. Ultimately, I look in a mirror and go, I feel fake. But here's the thing. I've got this woman that loves me, that gives me something and says, I want you to put it on. And so I put it on and I start walking in it, but then I want to take it off because I feel fake. But what I've learned is this. If I can push through that and just keep putting it on and each day keep walking and walking, you know what happened eventually? Eventually I stood in front of the mirror with my ripped jeans and my cool T-shirt And my hat on my head that originally I thought I looked like a conehead. But now I've got this. I'm standing in front of the mirror and dead set. I'm looking in that mirror going, I look good. (laughs) Can you believe that? I'm looking in the mirror going, can you believe you're me? I mean, oh, come on. How special are you? If reflections had feelings, I reckon the reflection would have felt the same way. But to start with, it felt awkward. But I've got this woman that gives me this stuff and says, I want you to put it on. And I put it on and I feel weird and awkward. And God's the same. He says, put on the new man. Put on the new man. Put on what I say you are. Put on how I see you. Put it on. And so we dare to believe for a moment. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. And if I'm believing all this stuff, it's, it's funny how my inferiority complexes, my insecurity, a lot of those things begin to kind of take more of a back seat the more I begin to walk in. What he, but then something happens and we go, oh, I'm gonna, oh, can't wait, I'm going to get it off. Because we become more comfortable walking in the fake person that we've become than the genuine person that God has made us now. Amen? What are you going to believe in your life? Can I get three volunteers? I want to finish with this quick illustration. I need three volunteers. Quick. Three volunteers. I need, I need three volunteers, Jackie, and Ruth, and Daniel. I need three volunteers. Any volunteers, Jackie, Ruth, and Daniel? Any volunteers? Oh, Jackie, Ruth, and Daniel. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, I want you to stand there. I want you just to stay there. Here's what I want you to do. All right. I want you to imagine that, that, that Daniel, Daniel is fact. Everyone give, give fact a clap. Fact is really... We love facts, don't we? Facts are truth. So Daniel's facing that way. He's fact. Now I've got Ruth in the middle, and, and, and Ruth is faith, right? Everyone loves faith, so give Ruth a clap. Facing that way. And then we've got feelings at the back. And feelings are good too. They're not bad. They're good. We love feelings, don't we? So give feelings a clap here, Jackie. Now, 
there's an old writer called Watchman Nee. Anyone ever heard of Watchman Nee? Yep, Watchman Nee to Shang Fang. He, really long name, but Watchman Nee because it's easy to say. And he shares this illustration in a book of his, and I've never, ever, ever forgot it. And it's a very simple illustration, but it's also very, very powerful. He says that fact, faith, and feelings were standing on the top of a, of a wall one day, walking together. So all of you, put your hands out like that. Put your hands out. And, and just take a couple of tiny steps down your forward. You guys with him? Now, here's what he said. He said, so long as faith keeps its eyes on fact, everything goes well. And guess what happens? Feelings follow. But he said, the problem with most of us is faith turns around and wants to look over its shoulder at feelings. And when it does, what happens? They both tumble off the wall. And he says, so long as... You can thank, thanks for that. You guys are great. And the Academy Award goes to <laughs> Fact. As long as we keep our eyes, faith, keep our faith on fact. And what is fact? Well, fact is, the fact of who I am is who God says I am. That overrides anything else. And as long as I keep my faith looking at fact and walking along, here's what I've found in my life. To start with, I feel like a real idiot because it feels fake. And what happens is then I give more precedence to my feelings. I turn around and go, oh, feelings. And I stumble and I fall and I keep in this vicious cycle. At some point, I'm going to have to go, you know what? I might not feel like it. But that's a fact. This is what God says about me. So I'm just going to keep my eyes on fact and I'm going to keep walking. And just like the clothing that I wear and my cone head hat, my testimony is this. Trust me, eventually your feelings will follow. Your feelings will come into alignment. And one day you'll wake up and go, you know what, not only... This, this whole who God says I am is not a theory or a concept. I actually believe it and I walk in it and I live it. And just like Gideon, I reckon God wanted Gideon to see himself as a mighty man of valor when Gideon saw himself as a frightened least of the least of the least. And there are too many people in the church who still see ourselves as the frightened least of the least of the least. And the thing is, we say, well, go home and do this and go and do that and start doing and start doing. I don't think the starting point is go and do. I think the starting point is start believing. Start believing. Get into this collection of ancient documents. What does God say about you? You see, reputation is earned. Identity is given. Reputations can be lost. Identity stays the same. We build reputations ourselves. God doesn't give us reputations. He gives us identity. And he says, you're a son and you're a daughter of mine. And I'm your father. Amen? Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for your word, God, and the truth of your word. And now, Lord, I know we're going to get up and I know we're going to scatter and go and do what we do. And um, it's going to be so easy to just go, that was a good Sunday or a bad Sunday and get on with life. God, it's so easy to walk out of here and to listen to other voices. And before we know it, we don't even remember what you said to us this morning. So God, I pray right now, Father, would you just, uh, Lord, seal in people's hearts the seeds that you've been speaking today. God, do not let the cares, the worries of life, the birds of the air come and snatch it away. God, as we get up, we leave this place. I pray that we would dwell on, we would think on, we would meditate on who it is that you say we are today. And God, I pray that we would be uh, uh, strong enough, God. Give us the courage. Give us the courage to go, you know what, that, that reality outstrips my own reality. A a and I want to believe you, God. You, you have no reason to lie to us. You have never lied to us. Yet sometimes we find it so hard to trust you because we let our own heart, our own emotions, our own feelings get in the way. Well, Lord, help us to see beyond all that and to dig our feet in the ground and to get a bit of steel in our backbone and go, you know what, no, it's about time. At some point in my life, I'm going to have to start believing what you say. And so, God, why not today? So I pray for each of us. And Lord, in the next seven days as we leave this place, we're going to bump into people that don't know you, that don't uh, understand that you died for them 2,000 years ago, don't understand that, uh, God, you have a great life, a plan, a purpose for them. And so, Father, I pray each person in this room that knows you, Jesus, give us a chance this week to tell somebody about the goodness of God, someone out there that right now needs to hear it, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.